There you go. And uh, I see Ian made it in time. Okay, so first let me introduce uh, uh, Mike. Mike uh, Parker Pearson is professor of British later prehistory at uh, University College in London. And he's Hello, fellow, Ian. <laughs> nice to see a, you. And he's a fellow of the British Academy. He yeah. has worked uh, on archaeological excavations in many countries, of course, England, Germany, Greece, Syria, United States, Madagascar, Easter Islands, etc. He has published 20 books, um, including Bronze Age Britain, The Archaeology of Death and Burial, uh, Food, Culture, and Identity in the Neolithic and Early Bronze Age, and of course, a book on Stonehenge <coughs> in uh, 2012. Um, to, uh, so my new book. Okay. It's a it's the first of four volumes of our research there since 2003. Oh, okay, yeah. it's a real passion. Okay, so for this presentation, Mike will give us a, the presentation and then uh, to join the conversation, we have Ian Hodder uh, and Umar Patel from Stanford University. Ian spoke uh, a couple of months ago on uh, Chatalo Yuk, the ancient site in, uh, which is now in Turkey, and uh, is professor of archaeology at Stanford. And Umar Patel is uh, one of his students who is, uh, who is studying Stonehenge. Um, okay, without further ado, Mike, Great. all yours. Okay, let's share the screen. I'll mute, I'll mute myself and remove my screen to give you maximum bandwidth, okay? Okay. Right, well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for sitting in on this. Uh, a rather strange situation, of course, but nice that we can talk across the world like this, even though it is getting uh, very cold and dark here in the UK. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to talk about not just our discoveries, but other teams that have been working on the World Heritage Site and further afield. Uh, so just give you a, a, a quick, in half an hour, run through of what we've been doing in the last 20 years. Now, how do we make this move on? There we go. Of course, everybody's got a theory about Stonehenge. And one of the most popular in the UK is that it was a temple for ancient Druids, an idea put forward in the 17th and 18th centuries. And it spawned a, a whole religion of Druidry. Uh, here are some Druids uh, at Stonehenge, for example. And uh, other popular theories are to do with its solstitial axis, uh, made very famous in the 1960s by the astronomer Gerald Hawkins, who suggested that Stonehenge was not only a calendar, but actually a computer capable of estimating um, quite uh, tricky astronomical uh, uh, phenomena such as lunar eclipses. Out of that came the heady days of the late 60s and 1970s. It was the site of a free festival which became known as Stonehenge, uh, and people developed all sorts of ideas in the wake of von Daniken. And uh, I have to say, one of the reasons that I steered well clear of Stonehenge, I think, when I was a student, was because uh, there were some pretty odd ideas about, uh, out there about what it was all about. But I did get dragged into it from a very curious direction. It was working in Madagascar with my colleague Rami Lisonina, who uh, is an archaeologist and he's also from a family that has a tradition of building megaliths. So it was a great treat to be able to get him to come to the UK in 1998 and I thought he'd be fascinated to see Stonehenge and uh, when I explained that we didn't know what it was for he looked at me as if I was an idiot. Have you learned nothing Mike working with me all these years in Madagascar? because the answer is very clear. We build in stone for the ancestors because stone is permanent and it is eternal, like the movements of the sun and the moon. Whereas 
we are temporary and traditionally our dwellings are built of temporary materials that perish such as wood and uh, I thought about this and I thought well it, this is a very different world contemporary and historical Madagascar to uh, ancient Britain and indeed Western Europe in the period that we call the Neolithic but it set me thinking that well it's interesting because at Stonehenge we have a whole landscape with many different monuments but they include a series of timber circles one of them is Woodhenge as you can see in this plan here which is at the complex that we call Darrington Walls and I set up a very simple hypothesis that if he was right we might be able to understand Stonehenge as one half of a larger complex at the centre of a domain of the ancestors, whereas Darrington Walls could be seen as the, at the centre of a domain of the living. And this set up really a series of expectations or predictions. And by 2002, I realised that I was going to have to find out. I couldn't wait to discover whether what Romili Sonina had suggested was actually nothing to do with how life might have been in Wessex five to 4,000 years ago. And uh, that sparked the beginning of a project and it was great that Ramil Sonnen was able to come back to see the, uh, the results of it uh, in 2009. And uh, what we did was to excavate at Stonehenge, to excavate at Darrington Walls and a series of other places. There's too much to go into in any detail but that's the team and the project morphed into three phases so we initially called it the Riverside project because we were interested in that relationship between the timber monuments and the stone monument uh, and uh, we felt that the river was important because it was the conduit between the two we discovered an avenue at Darrington Walls leading down to the river we also showed that the Stonehenge Avenue not only reached the river at that end, but also there culminated in a hitherto completely unknown stone circle that we called Blue Stonehenge because it had contained some of the uh, unusual Welsh stones, uh, uh, the stones that have come all, have come all the way from Wales. That then turned into looking at the resourcing of Stonehenge, our feeding Stonehenge project, and we're now uh, drawing to a close with the Stones of Stonehenge project, uh, characterising where the different rocks have come from to learn how these may have a bearing on understanding Stonehenge. For those of you who aren't necessarily au fait with prehistoric chronology, and I'm sure it's a subject you all love because I do, we're looking at a period for Stonehenge's five stages of construction between the end of the Stone Age and the beginning of the Bronze Age. And the periods in red, the, the end of the, the Stone Age, the late Neolithic, the late New Stone Age, uh, with Stonehenge being built very shortly after 3000 BC, and then going through a series of transformations, a major transformation at 2500, when it really took the form that we would recognize it today, and then more transformations, and finally out of use within the early Bronze Age. The monuments around Stonehenge, uh, many of them date to the same time or afterwards, but others date to before it. And it's very clear that it was set at uh, uh, 3000 BC in a landscape already busy with activity and ceremonial, that there are Neolithic causewood enclosures, there are Neolithic cursuses, there are long barrows, these are burial mounds, uh, well before Stonehenge was constructed. So it, it appears in a monument complex of a type that's not particularly unusual at that time. There are many of them that we now know about, just like the Stonehenge complex across. Right. Um, what uh, we also discovered in 2008 was that Stonehenge had been built at the end of a natural feature. Uh, we excavated underneath the avenue to discover that there was a, an earlier a uh, well, landform, uh, uh, one that had been formed in periglacial tundra-like conditions, presumably in a previous ice age, which had left a series of ridges and in between them gullies. And you can see them here in the trench in the foreground. And we realized that the, the ridges in particular had been enhanced by 
uh, Neolithic people cutting the avenue ditches on the outsides. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but uh, on both sides. So it was a discovery that not only were they using a natural phenomenon, but it had that particular orientation towards the midsummer sunrise at the solstice. And if you turn 180 degrees, you're looking in the opposite direction to the midwinter sunset. And it was this realization that this may have given the Stonehenge landscape one of its important attributes for Neolithic people because Stonehenge and the Avenue are two out of eight monuments within this landscape that have solstitial alignments, something that is um, not found in any, any similar number on any other ceremonial site of this broad period. And as I mentioned earlier, at the end of that avenue where it met the river, we found a, um, a, a dismantled stone circle. We could tell from the uh, voids and the imprints left in the base of the, um, the holes that these had indeed been blue stones. Moved in the early Bronze Age, we suspect, into the centre of Stonehenge. Excavating that Aubrey hole, we were recovering the remains of almost 60 people uh, who had been buried as uh, cremations by earlier excavators about 80 years before us. And this enabled us to, um, to date those burials and to see that they uh, had been buried there from the very start of the monument around 3000 BC, right through to uh, the next four or 500 years. Uh, they had the usual pathologies that we expect in that period, some fairly unpleasant arthritis, periostitis and uh, uh, disease of, uh, of the spine. Uh, but I think what was most intriguing was that not only were there very few children indeed, but most of the identifiable adults were women. And we now know that this is a pattern uh, which we can see at this time throughout Britain. Uh, my uh, previous PhD student, uh, Dr. Christy Willis, uh, has found out that uh, this is actually a, 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 a funerary uh, phenomenon that we find from 3400 BC through to about 2500 BC very different to the period beforehand, the early Neolithic and the period after the Beaker period where male burials predominate. So it's very interesting that it's women that are being more exalted in the monumental domain than men. The second stage of Stonehenge is when the uh, Sarsons go up and they uh, enclose the blue stones in uh, uh, series of formations, the famous Sarsen trilithons forming a horseshoe in the middle. So trilithon is two uprights and a lintel on top. And then you have the outer Sarsen circle, which as you can see in the photograph, has these uh, lintel stones. And then arranged within them, we have the, the first uh, setting to go with this stage, uh, uh, they're known by the technical term of Q&R holes, but the blue stones reset from their ori original positions in the Aubrey holes. We focused as well on Darrington walls, blue arrow, top, uh, top corner. And this has been known about from previous excavations as Britain's largest henge and uh, what we were able to discover was that not only, well, we, we uh, previous archeologists had revealed these timber circles, the Northern and Southern circles and Woodhenge, but also that there were a series of buildings uh, which dated to before the Henge and the Henge bank had covered up many of them. Uh, later on when the, the uh, settlement went out of use, uh, the, uh, the banks, just as they were being erected for the Henge, underneath them uh, we have a very large timber circle about 440 meters in diameter. Underneath the banks protected by their spread we discovered the uh, the floors of Neolithic houses, quite small square structures no more than about what 30 foot by 30 foot and uh, a central fireplace in the middle you can see me standing there uh, next to one of those and uh, 
They've been reconstructed now. If you manage to get to Stonehenge at any time soon or in the not so near future, you'll be able to see these reconstructed at the visitor center. And not only do we suspect that these may have been inhabited because uh, at the time that Stonehenge uh, stage two was being built, this, these could well be the builders' houses. And perhaps I think more significant than that, they demonstrated to us that Rami Lissonina was absolutely right, that here were the timber monuments surrounded by the living, whereas Stonehenge was yielding uh, nothing much apart from human burials. Here's a, uh, um, an artist's reconstruction, and you can see the southern circle in the background there and a rather wide um, access. That's the avenue that we discovered. Uh, it is aligned on the midsummer sunrise coming up towards the, um, the southern circle there, and the southern circle's entrance is aligned on the midwinter sunset. Sorry, mid, uh, no, got that wrong. Midsummer sunset and midwinter sunrise. And what I think was also interesting was to discover that that avenue, just like the one at Stonehenge, was also constructed on a natural feature in the bottom of a dry valley that just happened to be on the solstice. That's a reconstruction that the uh, television company Time Team did for us for the Southern Circle. And uh, I've really already mentioned about the, the solstitial orientations. Most recently in 2016, uh, our Stonehenge Riverside project collaborated with the Stonehenge Hidden Landscapes project, who've carried out a massive geophysical survey and radar survey of much of the World Heritage Site. And uh, they found a series of anomalies hidden underneath the bank, and uh, we excavated two of them to discover that they were holes for these enormous posts. Uh, when the, the settlement had just gone into ruin, but before the whole complex was turned into a henge. Uh, one of the interesting features of this was to discover that uh, although some of the, although these posts weighed around a ton each, they'd actually lifted them out vertically rather than let the posts decay in the holes. I leave that to your imaginations as to how they might have done it but I won't accept any answers that involve spaceships and tractor beams. A recent discovery from uh, Darrington Walls, again by the Stonehenge Hidden Landscapes uh, project rather than our own, uh, was that there's a series of very large holes forming something of a circuit, um, what is it, 800 meters outside of the Henge of Darrington Walls. You can see them all numbered up and, uh, in, uh, and painted in, in, in orange here. Some of them have been excavated by commercial, uh, commercial archaeologists in advance of development. And they, at the time, assumed that these were solution hollows that had formed in the chalk, um, entirely natural. And I think and some of them still stand by that now, even though, as you can see, they have a remarkable uh, symmetry, especially in relationship to Darrington Walls. There's no question that they encircle the complex. Um, in a way, it doesn't matter whether they are natural or not, because either way, they define a, a particular zone around Darrington. We have some dating evidence, not particularly good, um, drilling down uh, with uh, coring machines to get samples of carbon. And we think that it, they probably, if they are human made or even a mixture of human made and natural, they date to uh, after the end of the Darrington Walls settlement when uh, the, the Henge had been constructed. For those of you who may not be totally au fait with henges, by the way, a henge is for archeologists an enclosure where the bank is on the outside of the ditch. It's as if you're trying to keep something in. So it's actually an earthen enclosure. It's nothing to do with what may be inside of it. Unfortunately, by this definition that archeologists have come up with, it excludes Stonehenge from being a henge because its ditch is on the outside of its bank. 
but that's archaeologists and their illogicality for you, I'm afraid. Uh, what we do to get round that is we call Stonehenge a formative henge. There's an early phase around 3000 BC and earlier when they had their ditches on the outside. So now you know. Anyway, when uh, Vince Gaffney and his Hidden Landscapes team came uh, out with their exciting discovery last summer, I realized that they were actually confirming the ideas that Ramelison had put forward all that time ago, because basically that defined the domain of the living. And the more we've learned about the area of Stonehenge itself further to the southwest, we've realized that it sits in a zone which has curiously little activity, at least until the Bronze Age, that during the Neolithic, it's a zone that's exceptionally quiet and largely devoid of lithics and other um, uh, prehistoric trash in the, in the topsoil. So I refer to it as something of an empty quarter. So it seems that from what was really quite a, um, uh, uh, well, a hypothesis that was fairly speculative, we're actually getting to really flesh out the sense of how Stonehenge was organized spatially. We're also getting a, an idea about its temporality and uh, the extent of its influence. Thanks to the work of Umberto Alvarella and his faunal specialists, we know that there was a very clear seasonal pattern in the killing of the animals that they were feasting on at Darrington Walls. We have a huge assemblage of animal bones. 90% of it is pig, all domestic, and 10% of it is domestic cattle. And what he's shown is that there's a very definite peak in the autumn and winter months in, in terms of, uh, uh, of the ages of, of the pigs. So we suspect that although there may well have been a relatively small population there all year round, that they were actually um, concentrating their feasting activities in that autumn and winter period. And it may well be that for them, the winter solstice was perhaps more important than, than summer. Uh, our colleagues, in our, uh, our archaeological scientist colleagues have also been looking at the isotopes of these animals and what they've discovered is that uh, they have been, they, they were reared on a wide variety of geological landscapes. And we think that many parts of Britain are represented. Um, and uh, although it's possible that some come from as far north as the Lake District, we think that we're looking at, at uh, uh, individual animals that have come from uh, throughout the, the south, of, south of Britain, particularly from areas like Wales. And that really brings me on to the question of the stones, the third part of our, uh, of our project. And uh, as uh, I explained, we have two main types of stone at Stonehenge, the sarsons and the blue stones. Uh, the sarsons are the big ones. They've always been thought to come from the Marlborough Downs. But uh, we, we've just carried, we just finished a project over the last uh, few years, and we've discovered that actually they're from slightly closer, just 15 miles away. Um, there we go. So there, there are the Sarsons, if you've got any doubt about which ones they are. And they've come from an area called West Woods, uh, just to the south of the River Kennet, and a couple of miles from the largest stone circle in Britain of Avebury. And given that location, we've been able to sketch out some possible routes that they might have taken. They've basically gone for the nearest location, we think, where you could get those kinds of very large blocks. So it's, it's a matter of somebody, I think, deciding they want a certain size and then seeing how closely they can source them. That's clearly not the case for the blue stones. Much smaller stones, and most of them weigh less than uh, three tons, though some of the larger ones are just over three tons, because they come from 140 miles away as the crow flies, the very western edge of Wales. 
although we use the term bluestone, it's actually, uh, there are actually many different types of rock. And you can see I've got a list of them there in the bottom corner. There's spotted dolerites, unspotted dolerites, rhyolite, volcanics, and even uh, uh, two types of sandstone. Our work here has taken a dramatic turn thanks to the extraordinary contribution of Rob Ixer and Richard Bevins, two uh, geologists who, uh, uh, who have completely opened up the whole uh, mystery behind those blue stones. Uh, Richard is a geochemist and Rob is a petrographer. So that means that Richard looks at, uh, at chemical elements, whereas Rob looks uh, in, uh, at uh, the microstructure of the rock in thin section. So they make a, a great team. And what's so very important is that they've actually been able to pinpoint not just specific um, layers of rock, but actual outcrops that produced the rocks that have ended up at Stonehenge. Two of them we have been able to excavate. Uh, in, uh, 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 following their identification. And just to give you an idea of how remarkable their work is and how lucky uh, we have been, this is one of the sources of rhyolite at Stonehenge. It's a very distinctive outcrop and you can see there are natural pillars that have formed uh, in this volcanic, uh, 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 well, it's basically sheet lava. And uh, what Rob was able to show from the petrography is that all the way around this outcrop, the microstructure varies. That means that you can take the particular uh, rock at Stonehenge and the, the, the form it has in micro, in, under the microscope and say, well, there's only one point on this outcrop that matches that. And that's right where the red arrow is. And you can see the red arrow is also pointing to a gap where a pillar has been removed. So we actually have the most extraordinary smoking gun evidence there to, to show where the, where the pillar has actually come from. As you can see, we carried out excavations there and we could see that the quarrying was happening in 3400 BC. They seem to have, um, uh, it's, it's rather like uh, going to Ikea, but in the Neolithic. You simply decide what you want and then peel it off the rock. You just uh, jam in some wooden or stone wedges and then with some ropes, pull the pillar down uh, uh, onto an artificial platform at the base there that we discovered. And then you can drop that on, uh, in a loading bay arrangement and take it away on a wooden sledge we actually have the trackway leading from the, the drop-off point. The other uh, quarry that we investigated was uh, Khan Goidog, halfway up the mountain uh, of uh, the Preselis. And uh, it was here that we think that probably most of the stones still at Stonehenge today that are blue stones originated in this outcrop. Uh, it's been a bit of a surprise because up until Richard and Rob's work, it was always thought that there was a, a bigger, more impressive outcrop right on the top called Khan Menin or Khan Maini that was the source for Stonehenge. But in fact, it's this rather less dramatic one. But nonetheless, you can see all of the gaps where stones, where, where, where pillars uh, have been removed. And again, we got some very good dating evidence from the platform that they were uh, presumably lowering the monoliths onto. And then uh, there's a drop off point and off they went. What was different here was that we had a variety of radiocarbon dates from about 3,400 right through to 3,000. In fact, uh, the latest dates were identical with the dates for bluestone erection at Stonehenge within the 30th century BC. So we may have an interesting situation where uh, pillars were actually removed over quite a long period of time rather than a, in a single go. Now, to place those quarries in that Neolithic landscape, we're actually looking at one of the densest concentrations of Neolithic tombs uh, that are known as dolmens anywhere in Britain. So a dolmen, as you can see in the photograph there, 
uh, is a, a, a tomb with a, a great big capstone on the top. And that's the very famous one of Penta Ivan. So not only was it a, an area of, to, of a concentration of tombs, but we also have two Neolithic enclosures, one that is palisaded uh, on the north side of the River Nevin, and another one just across the mountain from uh, our quarries, uh, a, a course road enclosure called uh, Bank D. What you'll also see is the red circle, because right in the middle of this complex was the site that we have, uh, which we're about to publish tomorrow. It's Wine Mound, and it's nothing very much to look at. It's four standing stones, three of them have fallen over, and uh, they form an arc. They were recorded first a hundred years ago, uh, and it was thought then that they might have been uh, the remains of a stone circle. In a hundred years, nobody has bothered to look very closely at them. And uh, ideas by those early archaeologists that this might be a circle were largely dismissed or just simply ignored. Now, we went back to this site. And in fact, when we started on the Stones of Stonehenge project in 2011, we went straight there because we wondered about it. We carried out a geophysical survey, which revealed absolutely nothing. And we just concluded that uh, since the, the, the instruments didn't show us anything, there couldn't have been anything there. A serious mistake, uh, because eventually uh, we went back in 2017 and putting test trenches at the ends of the arc, we discovered two new stone holes. And in 2018, we realized that these were part of not just a circle, but a very large stone circle. You can see one of those stone holes here in the photograph. Uh, those are packing stones to support the monolith. And then you can see the square imprint. That's actually the imprint left by the base of the stone, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which actually tells us the, the, the size and shape of the monolith standing in there. And you can see from our fairly limited excavations, we discovered we had numerous features and six of them turned out to be stone holes. I have a suspicion that at least another two of them are, but we, we didn't have time to, uh, to confirm that. But one of them in the photograph here, and this is the one down the bottom labeled 91, turned up something really very exciting. First of all, though, we noticed that it had an entrance. We were lucky enough to excavate across that entrance between Stone 9 and uh, Stonehole 21. And we could tell this was an entrance because the stones were angled outwards, so like gun sights, so defining a, a gap uh, and a gap which uh, uh, aligns towards the midsummer sunrise. And it's also huge. It's 110 metres. There are only two stone circles in Britain that are larger. One is Avebury and the other is Stanton Drew in Somerset. What was exciting about Stonehole 91 was that it had a very unusual imprint in the base of it because it wasn't the usual um, rectangular or square uh, cross section. It was actually slightly kind of pentagonal Better than that, there was actually a nice large chip in the photograph there with the red arrow showing where it came from that had become detached from the monolith that had stood in there. And what was interesting was that it's of a type of rock, a type of bluestone that we know very well at Stonehenge. It's one of the unspotted dolerites. More than that, one of those unspotted dolerites, Stone 62, has a cross section and you can see it in the photograph at the bottom there, uh, taken from the, the top of it as a, a photogrammetric picture, which is an absolute perfect fit for that stone hole. So we very well possibly may have got one of the stones, or the, the, the original site of one of the stones now at Stonehenge. I'll just say a bit about the dating, um, but first of all to say 
Another very pleasing aspect is that not only does it share its solstitial orientation with Stonehenge, but also it has um, exactly the same diameter as the outer ditch. And in this picture, they are overlaid on each other. Um, the dating we achieved in two ways. One of the difficulties of working in West Wales is the soil is very acidic. So it means that you don't get the antler picked or animal bones from which you can get uh, essential radiocarbon dates. You have to rely on dating tiny pieces of charcoal. And we know that in these kinds of environments, earthworms move them up and down the soil profile, particularly down. So uh, 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 we also would expect to find residual charcoal uh, from the topsoil reincorporated into the pits formed by the stone holes. And that indeed turned out to be the case. Most of our dates are from the Mesolithic, the hunting and gathering period before the time of farming in Britain. Um, but what we did to counter this was to um, uh, include a second form of dating called optically stimulated luminescence. And this is where you uh, extract uh, soil samples in complete darkness, so within tubes, and uh, in the laboratory, you fire a laser at the grains of quartz, and that, uh, uh, from that you can measure the amount of energy that's been remnant in that grain since it was last exposed to light. And this was able to give us quite a wide date range between 3600 and 3200 BC. And we have half a dozen uh, radiocarbon dates on tiny pieces of charcoal that not only fall within that period, but also to the end of that range. So we know this circle was constructed 3004, 3300 maybe. Uh, so it's the same date as we have at the two quarries uh, and it's substantially earlier than Stonehenge. We can't be absolutely sure just yet about when the stones were pulled out. Uh, we do have optically stimulated luminescence dates, uh, which uh, are dating sediment that has filled the voids. And of course, the problem there is you can't get an actual date for the event because the actual event is a removal. You can only date the sediment that forms subsequently in the succeeding centuries and millennia. What we do know from the dating though is that they have to have been taken out before the beginning of the Bronze Age. We do though have a piece of charcoal from one of the extraction holes after the stone was taken out and interestingly enough that is around 3000 BC. So I think we are looking at a precursor, maybe the precursor for Stonehenge. How do they get them to Stonehenge? And uh, when I was a, a uh, schoolboy, uh, the archaeologist Richard Atkinson was uh, developing his theory that perhaps they went uh, by sea. The idea being that uh, you quarry from the top of Priscelli and then uh, toboggan down or however uh, till you reach Milford Haven and then get the stones onto rafts or slung between boats or whatever and sail most of the way. Our work has really put a bit of a, sp a spoke into that for several reasons. First of all, the quarries and Wine Mound are on the wrong side of the mountain. They're on the north side. So you, it would seem perhaps unlikely that they would have dragged them up the top and down. The other plank that has been removed for the sea route theory is to do with the, the, the largest blue stone at Stonehenge known as the altar stone. It's substantially bigger than the other blue stones. It's five meters long. And uh, it was always thought to have come from Milford Haven. But again, our geologists have done some extraordinary work. In fact, they're still trying to pinpoint it, but they know that it doesn't come from there and that actually it comes from uh, an, an area uh, really to the north of Cardiff, pretty much where that dashed line is going on, on the map, an area between Crick Howell and Abergavenny, if you're familiar with the, uh, the land of our fathers, as they call it in Wales. So, new thoughts about how they do it, how they did it. And um, 
of course, the, the fascinating question is why? And we're just starting to really focus on this now. Um, was it an act of conquest? And curiously enough, the very first story about Stonehenge by Geoffrey of Monmouth written in the 1130s that Merlin uh, sent 15,000 men, not to Wales, but to Ireland to dismantle the stone circle known as the Dance of the Giants for any Latin scholars in the audience, Corea Gigantum. And um, they then brought them back to erect them at Stonehenge as a memorial to the Britons who were treacherously murdered by Saxons during a parley. Um, that's one possibility. Another is that the people who lived uh, in the west of Wales might have brought the, um, the stones themselves. Might they have actually migrated, if not all of them, at least some of them perhaps. Uh, and uh, one of the things we've noted is that we've scoured that landscape for seven years and we can't find a trace of any activity after 3000 BC for the next thousand years, which is curious because in other parts of Britain, that's when the Neolithic really becomes visible in terms of hinges and, and other uh, substantial monuments. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a curiosity. I've also been wondering whether if we take Romili Sonnen's idea that stones were ancestors, uh, not necessarily just representing them, but you know, in Madagascar, they're the very embodiment of ancestors. And uh, if that's the case, and I think we have enough evidence to make a very strong case for that now, after uh, here we are 20 years later, then of course, where the stones come from is a key index of that ancestry. And then perhaps we're seeing something to possibly unifying different groups within Southern Britain. Uh, maybe people bringing their ancestral symbols. Another interesting factor, uh, you know, I don't quite know what to make of, but the recent, uh, oh no, we'll come on to that later, yes. So what about, were they stolen or were they brought? And uh, thanks to the work of Christoph Snurk uh, and as his team looking at strontium isotopes in the cremated bones of the people uh, buried at Stonehenge, we have a very interesting pattern because what we see is that although most of the people buried at Stonehenge were from the locality, from the Chalklands or not far off the, the Chalklands, those buried right at the beginning have an exotic signal, a signal uh, uh, that really you can only find in Britain in the West. So perfectly consistent with that area of West Wales. And I said, I, I wonder if this represents a, a migration event that we're seeing the first use of the burial ground at Stonehenge when the blue stones went up by the people that brought their, their, those stones. We've even got a cow in the ditch uh, dating to that very first moment. It's laid on, the, its jaw is on the bottom of the ditch. Uh, so same date as these, and that too has a strontium isotope value consistent with West Wales. We've, we've learned a huge amount thanks to ancient DNA. Uh, it's a, a young but evolving subject. Um, and I think one of the interesting uh, recent results is to see that we have uh, uh, Neolithic farmers arriving in Britain um, uh, in terms of the, the, the DNA legacy not from uh, the North European plains, so from the, the, the stream that really heads uh, along the Danube into the Lurse lands uh, and into France and Belgium, and uh, then one might think across the sea, but actually the genetic similarities of the Neolithic population of Britain are greatest with the early Neolithic population of Iberia. So these are ultimately descended, it looks like, either from people from Iberia or from groups that uh, were closely related and maybe came up through central France into Brittany and the, uh, the, the French coast. 
What's interesting is that within Britain, they form um, separate groups to, uh, or, or re there are regional differences. So that the groups in the east, as marked by the slightly redder uh, coloration on this map, uh, these have um, greater hunter-gatherer admixture in with the, the farmer populations, whereas those in, the, in Wales and the southwest and also Ireland, though it's not shown on this map, there is less admixture with hunter-gatherer groups. Uh, the suggestion being that we're looking at two routes of colonization, two primary routes for those Neolithic farmers, something that was sketched out by uh, one of my colleagues, Alison Sheridan, some years before the DNA evidence came to being uh, in the map there uh, which, uh, of Neolithic journeys. And uh, as you can see, there's the obvious Calais to Dover route, but also she uh, speculated on a, um, a Brittany uh, to uh, Irish Sea route, uh, founded on uh, the appearance of dolmen types that could be closely matched to uh, dolmens from around 4000 BC in Brittany. And interestingly enough, on her map, the first point of call for them is indeed North Pembrokeshire. So it, it raises the possibility whether the area of Wine Mound had some special significance. Maybe it's a kind of Plymouth Rock founding fathers, uh, or we might say find founding mothers, given the, the funerary evidence. And um, that, uh, that may be another interesting angle for future investigation. So where are we uh, at the end of all of this? Um, what we see in Britain uh, after 3400 BC is the regional differences in material culture really collapse so that there's a, a sharing of, of styles right across southern Britain in pottery and in monuments increasingly and then Stonehenge comes along on the back of all of that and it makes me wonder whether it might have represented some kind of political and religious unification following on after a more widespread cultural um, uh, 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 commonality. Are we also looking at the reason that the stones move is that they're being brought by people who are traveling with their ancestral symbols. These are their inalienable possessions and these are what they require to root themselves in the new Jerusalem that they're establishing in the Stonehenge reason. Is that the reason? Why Stonehenge? And maybe its importance is as a founding place, an axis mundi where the earth and the heavens are in harmony as demonstrated by that solstitial feature, which is of geologic or geological geomorphological origin. And then the second stage of Stonehenge, which completely outdoes that first one 500 years later. It's a massive undertaking and it makes Stonehenge the uh, eye-catching uh, iconic monument that it has been ever since. Is this yet another statement, restatement of unity? Because it's interesting that it is right on the eve of one of the biggest transformations in British prehistory. The arrival of people from continental Europe that we call the Bell Beaker people. And uh, geneticists have recently demonstrated that they're part of a migration stream that ultimately began in Ukraine. And um, uh, although our earlier speaker burials date to decades after Stonehenge stage two went up, is it actually put up in some kind of very early contact situation where there is an ultimately futile attempt to restate a sense of unity, which is about to disappear. I don't know, these are, these are thoughts we're going to be working on for the future. And I think that's it everybody, except to say, it's all changed my ideas about the context in which people build impressive monuments because I would have said all of these things are really important if you're going to go ahead and do something crazy like build Stonehenge. Um, economic boom, growing population, maximizing your surplus, long distance trade and exchange, 
all the signs are that none of those are the case. Uh, my colleague at UCL, Steve Shannon, uh, his study of, um, uh, of radiocarbon dates uh, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the periods that they span, where they are densest, where we have least, he suggests that we're looking at a smaller population in this period. The, the palynologists, the people who study, study pollen grains, also say the forests are growing back at the same time. And the people who study plant remains are telling us that there's a major decline in cereal cultivation, that uh, they largely give up on wheat, they uh, reduce their cultivation of barley, and it seems that they may actually be abandoning some of the, uh, the land that they've already been inhabiting. Uh, and in addition, very topical these days, from 3400 BC, the picture is really of cultural isolation from Europe. Uh, there's nothing, uh, no, no artifacts being exchanged across the channel, and yet it's only 22 miles. And that doesn't change from 3400. It gets worse, in fact, uh, and isn't uh, changed until the arrival of those beaker people who bring useful technology like the wheel and the ability to make metal, gold and copper. But all's fine after that because Britain gets reintegrated into Europe and becomes fully part of the Bronze Age. So uh, for our Brexit, uh, our Brexit disaster here in the UK, I can only say, I told you so. We've lived through this already uh, 150 generations ago. There we go. So that's it. And I'll hand you back to Pierre. Hey, thank, thank you, Mike. 